Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Uh, one of the best plays in recent years is currently being performed at the Lincoln Center Theater. Antoinette Nwando's Passover, which you can see Spike Lee's filming of on Amazon as well, is a heartbreaking, sometimes hilarious, and Beckett-like depiction of race relations in America. Everybody, please put your hands together for author Antoinette Nwando, director Dame Danya Tamor, and one of Passover stars, Namir Smallwood. Let's hear it. Um, Thanks so much for being here. I spend most of my days interviewing people uh, that are promoting TV shows and films, and I always get very excited when I can talk to people who have put plays together because uh, there's something different about the theater world than seeing a play. And I, I really love to get the chance to see them and to talk about them. So thanks for coming in. Thanks for having us. And for yes, writing a you. good show and directing and, and performing <laughs> well in a great show. Uh, let's talk about how this particular piece started for you because uh, clearly you wanted to address a lot of the conversation, a lot of the things that are happening in this country that have been happening for years, but are just a bit more uh, on the surface and being talked about more. But it seems like you also didn't want to, not necessarily not address it head on, but you didn't want to make something that felt solely based around that because it exists in an almost absurdist tradition in the way that the play is, is structured and how, how people react to it. So when did that part come in? Well, yeah, I mean, I think as a playwright, um, it's always my concern to be making art, right? And, I, and for me, art has a kind of timelessness and a kind of rigor that uh, makes it something different than, you know, a Law & Order episode. And don't get me wrong, I love Law & Order episodes, but I'm not looking to do something simply ripped from the headlines. Right. So there is a very contemporary element of the play. There is something that sadly is ripped from the headlines about the play, but uh, in order for it to um, be satisfying to me, I also had to uh, build a bit more of a puzzle and a bit more of a, um, a landscape for the play to live on, something that's a bit more epic and that is in conversation with these epic texts, both uh, Samuel, Godot, Samuel Beckett's, woo, Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot and also the Exodus story the biblical Exodus story. So it's like taking those two stories as foundational texts. How do I talk about um, violence against y young black men, specifically police violence, in a way that also touches on those other texts? That's sort of important for me. What was it about Waiting for Godot that you, or what was the central theme that from Waiting for Godot that you wanted to pull into Passover. Well, it's actually the conversation between the biblical text and Waiting for Godot that was super interesting to me. I grew up in church, and so obviously anybody who's familiar with the Exodus story, you know, the children of Israel are in Egypt, and then God basically promises them a promised land, and then they do have sort of a torturous journey to get there over 40 years, but then they do get there, and that promise is fulfilled. And in the African-American community, especially in the antebellum South, the um, language, the biblical language of the promised land and crossing the River Jordan is very common. So on one hand, there's this, like, imbued sense, you know, if you look at Martin Luther King's writings, for instance, there's this biblical language of we will reach the promised land, we will reach the promised land. And then when you read Waiting for Godot, which is an absurdist play written in the late 50s, about two uh, tramps, two older men, who are waiting for a man named Godot who never comes. So on one hand, you have this, like, this promise that's being fulfilled if we just keep going. And then on the other hand, you have this text that's saying, nobody's coming. There isn't, you know, the person, Godot, who every day promises them, I'll come tomorrow, I'll come tomorrow, and then he never comes. And so it's like, for me, those two texts were literally saying antithetical things, and that's sort of the puzzle that I like to build for myself. How do I bring these two seemingly, these two texts that seem to hold disparate worldviews, how do I make them talk to each other? And how did you how did you go about when you were writing the play? How did you go about making sure that one element of what you were doing didn't outweigh the other? A lot of rewrites. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I have like. I guess it's such a basic question to ask when you ask writers this because they're like, "I just did the work." Yeah, but yeah. But I, I imagine I mean, that that could be a very difficult part of a, of this process because you clearly absolutely. have something that you want to say, but then you also have very clear aesthetic things that you want to say, which both without without paying very clear attention to those two things could outweigh one another. And it doesn't do that in this in, in this piece. Thank you. I mean, I think that's a testament, yes, to the fact that I do have 
upwards of 90 drafts of the play on my computer. And, but then also the collect, yeah. Yes. <laughs> but then also the collaborators that I have who, um, you know, bring their brilliance into the play and just make it better and just, you know. I'll ask you one question about I'll ask you one question about your drafts uh, because I find the process for writers uh, endlessly fascinating. Everybody has a different process. You say ninety drafts. When is that a bit of an exaggeration because each draft is like minor changes here and there, or do you feel like in all ninety they are drastically different drafts? I have about seven drastic drafts. Yes. And then between those seven, there are smaller drafts. But the thing about it is that, like, and when what happens with me, especially on this process, is sometimes I would take three steps forward in a draft while also taking, like, three true steps forward while also taking ten false steps forward, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Yeah. And so then you have to, it's like, oh, no, draft four, we, we did three good things and ten bad things. So I now i got to go back to draft three but bring those three good things with me, it's, I could go on. And so often forever. you add three good things that take up more pages, and Absolutely. so you have to find other pages to remove, and hopefully there aren't good things that only, only good things left to be removed, so that you I mean, have hopefully time. all the good things are there now. Mm -hmm. I actually, it's funny, I was yeah. cleaning out my office, and I found, uh, no lie, a, a monologue that I had written in 2014 mm -hmm. that's very very different than the monologue that ends the first act, but there were four or five phrases that I was like, oh, we, we, I, we, we got just the good things. Mm. So. Uh, when, did, when, did, when did you join the play, and what were the conversations like in terms of staging it? I joined the play right before uh, we began rehearsals at Steppenwolf. So we spoke a lot about... Um, I think uh, essentialism. So only having things on stage, what, what they would use, what they would need, and having nothing more so that the language would be the absolute star of the piece. So maintaining that conversation with Godot there as well. Absolutely. And I also, I think one thing Antoinette and I talked a lot about was that the, it, this play is from the perspective of Moses and Kitsch, two young black men. And by removing everything else on the stage except for them, they are the most human thing there. So audiences that maybe aren't used to seeing characters like that be the protagonist, it, I think, allows them to embrace the humanity of these characters and fully invest in them as their heroes because there aren't any other distractions. There's nothing else to hold on to. And I think that's also important in the minimalism or essentialism of the set itself. Um, another thing we worked on a lot in Chicago and also in New York was the physicality of the play. Uh, every rehearsal begins with like an hour and 20 minutes of physical warm up for me and the actors to get their bodies warm. Um, they do a lot of partner work and I think what that does is it creates intimacy because the characters in the play have also known each other for their whole lives. So how do you create that in three and a half weeks? Um, and I think what that- What does partner work entail? So basically, I do this very rigorous physical warm-up that gets everybody really actually sweating. Namir can probably talk to you about it. Um, <laughs> but I think the end goal for me are these partner stretches that um, are really intense. They involve, you can't stretch uh, as deeply alone as you can with a partner. Um, and Pulling the arms back a little bit? No, it's Putting actually like sitting, in, it's like sitting in butterfly, having somebody put, your hands, put their hands on your thighs, your chest on their back, and then you breathe together and lean forward, and you open the hips, which is a place where like a lot of people carry stress and anxiety, and so it's a very vulnerable place, vulnerable place to open. Um, and you also have to rely on your partner to help you stretch deeper than you could yourself. And it's also very interesting to do this with men who I think are not encouraged to touch each other or breathe together or even speak quietly and intimately together. So that creates an intimacy and a level of trust that I think shows in the kind of physical work that they're able to do in the play itself. So Namir, how did you feel when you had to do these stretches for the first weeks of rehearsals? Uh, the first week was a little strange, <laughs> but um, it, it really helps with the intimacy between Moses and Kitch. Um, like, I had worked with John before, who plays Moses, and uh, John Michael Hill. And we didn't really have anything together, but, you know, it really allowed us to 
really become familiar with one another and one another's, you know, process. And yeah, it was it was really it was really strange at first, but then it just okay, you start doing stuff in scene that, you know, we were doing in warm ups and it just makes everything seamless. How was it, uh, as an actor, how was it handling the language? I mean, the play opens with this uh, exchange between uh, Moses and Kitsch where they're not actually throwing out full sentences, nor is it clear exactly what they're saying except for the tone of how you guys handle. Uh, hold on. Hold on. I see. I've, I've got peripheral vision. I see you there. Uh, but they're essentially, I mean, if I remember correctly, they're kind of going, the fuck, the fuck, like over uh, like a, a number of times, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. no, I'm, I'm actually just laughing because I'm like, y y you should see it on the page. There's yeah. no, uh, I don't use punctuation in this play, and it's all line broken, like poetry. So even more so, how do you figure out what the intention behind those lines are? What, like during the rehearsals, I imagine that's a lot of the conversation. Yeah, like reading it by itself, like I kind of got the intention. Um, even without punctuation, even without capitalization, any of that stuff, I could, I could understand like the intention behind the the words, you know. But putting it on its feet, it's all about rhythm. So for me personally, that took a while to uh, get the rhythm and you know the speed to what the uh, the first. 22 pages, 23 yeah. pages is the hardest of the play. Is it still hard every night? It's getting better. <laughs> and it probably won't be there on closing. You know what I mean? You've been doing the show now for how long? Two weeks. Yeah. Oh, two weeks. Oh, Not yeah. that long. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's about, the whole play is about rhythm. And it's a lot of ebbs and flows and peaks and valleys, you know what I mean? So there's some really, really high, um, hilarious kind of stuff. And then there's some real, real tragic stuff that you have to go through. And then you go right back to a high, you know? And so it's, it's, it's a lot to work with as an artist, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, you and Moses do a wonderful job. Uh, the, excuse me, John, who plays Moses. The both Thank of you, you do a wonderful job together. Um, Gabriel Ebert, who plays, for all intents and purposes, the antagonist of the of the of the play, the two kind of antagonists, uh, is really forced to kind of turn on a dime a, a few times in the show. How was it crafting those scenes with him and writing them? I love, love, love the line of "Everything is mine," essentially. Thank you. <laughs> um, I mean, I think I. I, I think crafting it with, with Gabe was great. I mean, the play was mostly written. We did some tweaking and some fine tuning once he came aboard. Um, and he just has a way with language as well that really sort of give, gave me a sonic roadmap to sort of hear who Mr. was specifically, the first character that he plays, and to sort of hear his vocal tics in a way that I think, you know, Gabe has a real respect for the language, so I could hear that really nicely. And then I think all three of the actors, like Namir said, one of the things I like to do in plays are sort of what I call the switchback um, emotional turns, that I, I do like it when the character has to turn on a dime. Mm -hmm. um, oddly enough, uh, one of my biggest influences for character work in this play and more generally is actually cartoons, especially classic cartoons like uh, Bugs Bunny and um, Daffy Duck and uh, uh, what's, the, what's the one? Wiley Coyote and, and those kinds of people. You know what I mean? Where it's like there's these emotional turns that go, that are pretty manic and pretty uh, sudden yeah. that I think, um, yeah, gives, gives the actor something to play with. Right. Is that something that you talk about in rehearsal? Like watch cartoons together? We, we did, actually. Another big inspiration of the play is the Disney film, The Prince of Egypt. So we all got together and watched that as a company. Um, and we also talk about, movie. yeah, we also talk <laughs> about, and I think these are similar influences, but like great comedy duos like Abbott and Costello, Ren and Stimpy, um, as examples of how to fully embrace the extremity of the play. Um, I think that if you were to try to do this play 
totally realistically, it would firstly be too hard to digest for the audience, and you would lose the comedy and the absurdity of the situation. So we spoke about that a lot. I think that for Gabe uh, in playing Mr., he is such an extreme character, and so is the police officer. So he's playing two sides of, of one person or of, uh, of an idea of what these kind of people can be. And um, I think all three actors have to be athletic, and they have to be technically minded as well as emotionally minded. And I think one thing I've discovered through working on this play with Antoinette, but other plays of hers as well, is that if you achieve the thing technically first, then you'll be surprised the emotion will just come. Once you get the rhythm correct or you get the physicality correct, then the emotionality and the realism will just fill itself in. So that's, I think this team of actors really can work like that. I wonder if you know actors who follow like the method, for instance, I don't know if they would be able to do this play because you can't just go on emotional realism. You also have to be achieving the cartoon aspects or the Beckettian aspects or the commedia aspects at the same time. Meaning that at that point you rely more on uh, a kind of craft, like, than... I think that the craft of these three actors, I've never worked with such an accomplished company of actors before, um, where ego is not uh, an issue. That's also been huge, I think, in both in Chicago and also here. Um, but I think that all three actors have an incredible technical skill, and they're all so sharp, and they're also deeply emotional. So I think they just they kind of have both sides, which is what the play requires. Yeah, it would very much fall apart if it was based in realism or the performances were mm -hmm. consistently based in realism. There would essentially end up being no kind of roller coaster and power dynamic change and humor of any kind. It'd be like people playing buried child realistically. You'd be like, what is this boring thing that makes no sense? I, I also think that there's a self-awareness that we learned a lot from that, that happens in Godot that I think is also happening with the actors in Passover that allows the audience to know that they're in safe hands. They, I hope that the audience feels like we have crafted an experience for them and that they can trust that and they will be on that experience for 80 minutes and it will be complete and it will go to extreme places. Um, and I think that the actors help that by playing those extremes. And so how much did the, not, obviously the words don't change, but how much did the play change for you when it started getting staged with actors and rehearsals versus you know the original vision that you had when you were writing the words down? Because so often I think when it comes to theater, um, it's rarely talked about how the play can shift and how it can change. Whereas in movies, it's like, oh, there are several steps to the process and everything shifts and change. With theater, everyone just talks about it being the playwright that is the end-all, be-all, you yeah. know? <laughs> well, the words actually did change. Uh, they changed significantly for the Steppenwolf world premiere, which happened a year ago. And then we did a lot more surgical changes for New York. So before Steppenwolf, the Ossifer character did not exist, actually. So I literally created that character whole cloth during that rehearsal process, which was also just a testament to my collaborator. The officer character? Absolutely. Really? Yeah. How did that come up that you needed to add this character? Well, I had been, I mean, it took, uh, from day one till now has been about four and a half, almost five years mm -hmm. with this play. So I had gone back and forth with, should I, I know, should I add this character or not? And originally a lot of friends, people I trust, uh, were thinking about Godot because in Waiting for Godot, obviously the two scenes repeat themselves. And so people were just like, if you bring an officer character in at act one, by act two, everybody in the audience is gonna know that he's the bad guy and they're gonna know that he's the one who's gonna maybe you know, do some terrible things. And so people were like, the audience will be ahead of the play. So for a long time, people had told me, don't, you know, it, it'll, be boring and we'll kind of know what's going to happen way before it happens, mm -hmm. which is why it took me a good long time to realize that act two in my play, even though it's obviously in conversation with Beckett, it's not a complete, um, I, I don't just repeat what happens in act one in act two, as far as like when the characters come on stage and when they enter. So that took me a little while to figure out and to then um, just sort of contemplate, you know, the violence and the tone that the officer brings into it. You know, that was something that I went back and forth on. But then by the time we got to Steppenwolf, I had thought about it and thought about it. I had had a workshop of the play in New York at Cherry Lane Theater where there was no officer and I saw what that was. 
and it just wasn't enough for me. It wasn't truthful enough. So I, yeah, I came to Chicago kind of locked and loaded and ready to do some really intense rewrites. And then once we put that up in Chicago, then I had a year to think about it so that when we started at Lincoln Center, it was a lot more surgical. It was a lot more beat work of like, okay, what if we just change these lines around a little bit so that if that person says that first and then this person says this, the scene, will, that moment will have a little bit more punch. And then I did rewrite the ending monologue. Hearing that it took you four to five years gives me so much hope for the meandering, plotting bullshit that I've been trying to write for a year. <laughs> Just keep going. Uh, let's get some questions from our audience. What do we have here? Hi. Um, so uh, Spike Lee did a version of the uh, film version of the play. Uh, how did he get involved? And uh, since that was filmed in Steppenwolf, has the, do you feel like the, the play has changed now from what the movie is? Yeah, um, so how I'll, I'll, ask, I'll answer those uh, one at a time. So first, uh, Spike Lee and I, and Danya, actually, we are all at the same agency. We're all at ICM. And so uh, anytime somebody gets something that Spike might like, they, they shuttle it to his office and they send it to him. And my play was one of those properties. He hadn't seen the play. He just got the script and he read it and he fell in love with it instantly. And um, now that I do know him, he is a person who gets things done. And when he likes something, he gets it done. So he called me and he was like, I want to film this in Chicago. And we ended up, and then like five weeks later, we were filming it in Chicago. So uh, Steppenwolf, by that time, the production had closed. Steppenwolf was gracious enough to then rebuild the set in their downstairs theater. It had played upstairs. They rebuilt the set in their downstairs theater. We had like, four rehearsals, maybe three and a half, with the actors. We actually added an actor, because in film, um, the character who plays, on the, on the, in the play, one actor plays two characters. He plays Mr. and the officer. But in the filming of it, Spike was like, that doesn't really make sense. Character, actor doubling doesn't make sense in film. So we added a fourth actor, Blake DeLong, who literally jumped in, had three rehearsals, played the officer. Um, like Danya said, I think she mentioned Spike made some a uh, few changes to the script where he made it specific to Chicago. He obviously, after having done Chirac, he wanted to address uh, Chicago and the the tone and the the atmosphere and the violence potentially in Chicago as well. So he made it very specific to that place. Um, they brought in ten cameras. We brought in an audience from the south and west side of Chicago. So that was another huge difference. It was a primarily African American audience for the filming. Uh, so it's, it's, yeah, it's up now on Amazon Prime. And yes, the, the script has changed since that production. But the way I think about it, for me, it's like, you know, usually when you have a play up, it's very ephemeral. It's there and then it's gone and nobody's ever going to see it. Maybe the theater will do some wide angle archival footage just to film it. But I'm like, my archival footage is Spike Lee and it's on Amazon. So the fact that he captured like the world premiere of my first professional play is just, I mean, literally when he called me, I was just like, oh my God. <laughs> like, how does that happen? <laughs> Hello, Spike Lee. Literally. <laughs> and then he got on a plane and took me to dinner. And I was like, you're here. We're eating pasta. <laughs> it was amazing. And what was it like talking to Spike Lee? He lives up to everything that you kind of think about. I've interviewed him a couple of times. He's like, you are Spike Lee. Like, yeah. you, that, that's like, exactly. He, you are no different than what I thought you would be. It's so awesome. He is exactly who he is. And, and, and more so. And so it's much amazing. integrity. So much integrity with that. I love it. I, since then, have worked on him. I was in the writer's room for She's Gotta Have It. So now I kind of oh. know him on a daily. But yeah, he's exactly who he is always. And he gets the work done. He makes excellent work at just his his ability to just keep working is amazing to me. I have so much respect. Well, he's so been doing respect. it for so long, he can rely very heavily on his instinct and his gut. I think there's very little indecision or uh, inability to or, or like questioning of himself at this point. Absolutely, you know? yeah. For better or worse, there's great work and then there's work that maybe like okay, but still I mean, he's kind of no, 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 no. That's not for you. No, no, yeah. Is that for you to say? <laughs> Chirac is a criminally underrated movie. It's it's a, a beautiful, radical film. That it's yeah. super, He's doing something that I think actually is very similar to what Passover is doing, is being in conversation with these canonical texts and allowing us to enter them and see them and see their usefulness in modern conversations, mm. which I think is, is a really interesting project to be about, a, pro, a really interesting project to do. So, yeah. I think we have time for one more. 
Hi, we're going to take an online question from Jane. Jane would like to know, as creators, how do you feel truly done with the characters um, that you're directing or writing? And do you have any advice for playwrights? Um, as in terms of truly done, I think with this play, we had an amazing uh, chance to get to work on it again after having done it at Steppenwolf and then having done it again for the filming and now doing it in New York. So I think at every instance, we were able to get to a, a mindset where we felt done because we had to be, because the time to rehearse is over and the play lives. So I think that's something that is really wonderful about the theater is that there's a limit and there's so many limitations. So it kind of forces you to be done. Um, and so you have to stand behind your work in a way that I find really appealing. Um, to playwrights, I would say the most important thing is to write what you think is good and to really be in touch with your own voice and your own worldview and what you actually like to see um, and start from that kind of place. That's what I would say. Yeah, for me, it's interesting. Uh, I am currently having a physical reaction that's actually telling me that the play is done. Uh, every time I finish a project and I'm truly finished with it, I get sick. So I'm, I'm actually a, a little, I'm getting over it. This is like day four, so I feel better. But the last three days, I actually did not feel well. So that's literally when my body wants to let something go, I, I get sick. And then I let it go. And then also, last night... When I saw the show, I uh, we're still in previews, and I was in the audience, and I told Danya, last night was the first time. I mean, I've seen it a million times, and last night was the first time I actually got emotional, and that for me was another way that I my in emotions and my intuition were telling me that I had enough distance. I was no longer sitting in the audience as the playwright; I was just sitting in the audience as an audience member, and I got to have the experience that everybody else was having. So, like those two very not, you know, I, I, I don't know if anybody else's body does that, but that's like sort of my gut and my body and my intuition telling me like, okay, you're literally done because now I was just enjoying it as an audience member and it didn't feel like mine anymore. It just felt like I was there. Um, and then advice for playwrights. I'm, I'm that person that just says you, you have to write. That's my advice. Just actually do the work. Well, as an actor, I mean... We're never done. Um, if the show closes, you know, or we're on the set and we wrap a movie, we're still going to think about certain moments. <laughs> like, oh, I wish I could have said that better. I would have done it like this. Um, yeah, I mean, doing this play, I can never be done with it because every day is like there's something I feel like I could have done better, I could have said better, and... Just in this conversation, like I had a thought <laughs> <laughs> about the end of the play, and just like, oh, okay, I can try that tonight. You know what I mean? So it's just never, never done for me. Um, I love the play. Congratulations! Thank it's you. currently Thank up you. at the Lincoln Center Theater, right? How much longer is it? Is it running? We'll run through at least July fifteenth. Fantastic! Everybody, go see Passover. It's really wonderful, and give them a round of applause. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs>